Hi everybody and welcome to our module on gastrointestinal embryology. Let's begin by going back to a point very early on in development. Just a few weeks after fertilization, the embryo looks something like this drawing on the left. There are two cavities, one's called the yolk sac and one's called the amniotic cavity, and where they meet, this is called the embryonic disc, and this is where all the action is in the growth of a human being. This is where all the organs and structures that we know are going to come from. What happens early on in development is that this embryonic cavity folds in multiple directions. It folds in this direction. It also folds in the direction coming in and out of the screen. So it folds in four directions and wraps around the yolk sac. And after a few weeks, you then have something that looks like the drawing on the right side of the screen. You can see this blue line that was the interior of the amniotic cavity is now stretching all the way around the growing embryo. What you have in the middle of the screen is a white area, which used to be the yolk sac, and this is now a hollow tube, and that is going to grow into the digestive tract. That is called the digestive tube, and it comes from the yolk sac. This picture on the left shows a zoomed-in view of the embryonic disc. Remember, that's the interface between the amniotic cavity and the yolk sac. That's where all the action takes place and where all the organs we know in the adult are going to come from. And if you zoom in on that embryonic disc, you will see that it's made up of three layers. The middle layer, shown in red, is called the mesoderm. One of the outer layers is called the ectoderm, that's shown in pink. The other outer layer is called the endoderm, that's shown in brown. And as this early structure develops into the structure on the right side of the screen, you will see that once again there is a hollow tube that comes from the yolk sac, shown here. That's going to develop into the digestive tract. And you can see in this picture on the right that it's surrounded by brown. And I show you that to remind you that the surrounding structures of the GI tube come from the endoderm. So things like the lining of the GI tract and many of the abdominal organs all come from the endoderm, which wraps around this digestive tube, which came from the yolk sac. Just outside of that endoderm, you can see red, and that red represents mesoderm, and that's where all the connective tissue and muscles surrounding abdominal structures in the GI tract are going to come from. So here's a summary slide just to make these points clear. The endoderm develops into the GI tract. It forms the GI tract epithelium and the glands. Many organs bud off from this, including the liver, pancreas, and trachea. We'll talk about all of this in this module today. The mesoderm forms the surrounding structures, things like the stroma, the GI tract connective tissues, muscles, peritoneum. And then the spleen is a special organ in the abdomen because it comes from mesoderm. We'll talk about this later. Most of the abdominal organs come from endoderm, the spleen is unique in that it comes from mesoderm. As the embryo continues to develop, it eventually will start to look like this. At this point, we have a long gut tube. This portion up here is going to form the mouth and the pharynx. These are the pharyngeal pouches. And then the remaining length of the developing digestive tube can be split up into three sections. The first section is called the foregut, the next one is the midgut, and the last one is the hindgut. And what's important to know about these three sections in the developing embryo is that each one will eventually be supplied by a different branch of the abdominal aorta. All the structures that derive from the foregut will be supplied by the celiac trunk. That includes the esophagus and the stomach, which is budding out here, and other structures. The midgut will all be supplied by the SMA, and the hindgut will all be supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. And at this stage, the entire yolk sac has mostly been converted into the digestive tube, except for this little portion out here, which is called the vitaline duct. This will eventually disappear, but as we'll talk about later, there are some disorders where it persists into the newborn baby, and this can cause some congenital anomalies. So this slide summarizes the different portions of the GI tract and where they derive from in the developing embryo. So the foregut gives rise to everything supplied by the celiac trunk, and that's all the structures from the mouth to the ampulla of vatter. The midgut gives rise to everything supplied by the superior mesenteric artery, or SMA. This is everything from the ampulla of vatter to the transverse colon. And finally, the hindgut gives rise to everything supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. That includes structures from the transverse colon to the rectum. Next, let's talk about the mesentery. When you look inside the abdominal cavity, you can find sheets of connective tissue called mesentery. Mesentery is made up of a double layer of peritoneal tissue, and it suspends the abdominal organs from cavity walls. Blood vessels also travel through the mesentery as they go from the aorta to the organs which they supply with blood. Organs that we call intraperitoneal are entirely enclosed and wrapped with mesentery. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Organs that we call retroperitoneal are covered by peritoneum only on their anterior wall and then they lie against the posterior abdominal wall. Here's a recreation of some structures in the abdomen to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. The red line here represents the mesentery. And you can see that there's a loop of small intestine here completely wrapped in mesentery. So that would be an intraperitoneal structure. 
Other structures in the back of the abdomen, like the aorta and the inferior vena cava, are not wrapped in mesentery. They are retroperitoneal structures. They have mesentery covering only their anterior wall. As we talked about earlier in this module, connective tissue structures in the abdomen do not derive from endoderm. They come from the mesoderm. So the entire mesentery comes from the mesoderm, and that's easy to remember because it has the word mes in the name of the structure. And there are two types of mesentery that form in the fetus. The first type is towards the back of the fetus. That's called dorsal mesentery. Dorsal means towards the back. And the second type is towards the front. That's called ventral mesentery. Ventral means towards the front. Most of the connective tissue structures in the abdomen come from dorsal mesentery. The reason for this is because the gut moves away from the posterior wall in development and the dorsal mesentery grows between the gut and posterior wall so that most structures are covered by this mesentery. To understand this better, imagine that we have the posterior wall of the fetus and we have the gut tube here. It is going to be covered in mesentery and then it is going to migrate away from that posterior wall. As it does so, it will pull that mesentery with it, and the result will be that this dorsal mesentery coming off the back of the fetus ends up covering most structures in the abdomen and being responsible for most of the mesentery in the abdomen. Ventral mesentery, on the other hand, only exists in a couple of places. You can find it in the esophagus. You can also find it in the stomach. That's one of the most important places. We'll talk about that in a second. And you can find it in the upper duodenum. It is derived from a structure called the septum transversum, which is mesenchyme tissue that also comes from the mesoderm. What's important to know about the ventral mesentery is that the liver grows into this, and thus two structures on either side of the liver come from the ventral mesentery. The first one is the lesser omentum, and the second one is the falciform ligament. This is an image depicting the septum transversum, and remember, all the ventral mesentery comes from the septum transversum. You can see that it's a sheet of tissue going across the liver to the stomach, and the liver is growing into it. This means that when the baby is fully formed, all that will remain of the septum transversum and the ventral mesentery will be this connection between the liver and the anterior abdominal wall, and that's called the falciform ligament, and the connection between the liver and the stomach, and that is called the lesser omentum. Here's another picture of the liver and stomach. You can see the lesser omentum is this structure in here between the stomach and the liver. Not shown is the falciform ligament, which is on the outside of the liver and connects to the anterior abdominal wall. Both of those structures derive from ventral mesentery. The mesentery goes by different names depending upon which abdominal organ it is surrounding. So the mesentery around the stomach is called mesogastrium. The mesentery around the duodenum is mesoduodenum. And around the colon is mesocolon. Hopefully you all get to go into the anatomy lab and open up the abdomen, and when you do, you will see that there is this sheet of connective and fatty tissue hanging off the stomach, and that is called the greater omentum. The word omentum is a Latin word for apron, and the greater omentum hangs from the greater curvature of the stomach and covers the intestines. It is derived from mesogastrium and therefore derived from mesoderm tissue. There's also the lesser omentum, which we saw on the last slide. That is a connection between the stomach and liver. And as I said before, it's high yield to remember that that structure is formed from ventral mesentery. If we go back to this picture here, this is the greater curvature of the stomach, and this is the greater omentum hanging off of it. If you go into the anatomy lab, you will see that it literally looks like an apron that hangs off the stomach and covers the intestines. This is the lesser curvature of the stomach, and this is the lesser omentum, which is a much smaller structure than the greater omentum. Now what I'm going to do is talk about each of the three sections of the embryonic gut tube, the foregut, the midgut, and the hindgut, and I'll talk about how each section develops and the important anomalies that you need to know about for step one. We'll start by talking about the foregut. This is what forms the esophagus and the stomach, and the most important thing to know about the foregut is that the lung will bud off from the esophagus in the developing embryo. This budding off of the lung is called the respiratory diverticulum, or the lung bud. Eventually, a structure called the tracheoesophageal septum will form, and it will divide the respiratory diverticulum, or the lung bud, from the esophagus, and then the fetus will go on to mature and develop a separate trachea and esophagus. If there is abnormal development of this tracheoesophageal septum, that leads to congenital pathology, and the most important pathology to know about is esophageal atresia. This is a closed esophagus, and this is what occurs when the septum deviates posteriorly. If we go back to this picture, shown right here is the lung budding off from the esophagus, and a septum needs to form between the lung and the esophagus to divide the two tubes into separate structures. If this septum deviates posteriorly, it will cut off the esophagus, and then the esophagus will end in a blind tube, and that's called esophageal atresia. There are three forms of esophageal atresia. The most common form is called esophageal atresia, that's EA, with a tracheoesophageal fistula. A tracheoesophageal fistula 
is a connection between the trachea, which is here in the lungs, and the esophagus, which is this distal portion of the esophagus. The proximal portion of the esophagus has been cut off. That's why it's called esophageal atresia. Another form of esophageal atresia, which is less common, is called pure esophageal atresia. This is where the esophagus ends in a blind tube, and the more distal esophagus is not connected to the trachea at all. And then finally, there's a more rare H-type, where the esophagus and the trachea are both separate tubes, but they are connected by a fistula. When the fetus develops esophageal atresia, the esophagus does not connect to the stomach, as we have just seen. This means the baby cannot swallow amniotic fluid. This means there will be an excess of amniotic fluid present in the mother, and that is called polyhydramnios. When these children are born, they will have drooling and choking and vomiting, and all of this is because accumulation of secretions is occurring in their mouth because they cannot swallow those secretions and pass them into their stomach and intestines. To try and control the excess secretions, a nasogastric tube is often passed into the stomach of babies who have symptoms like this. But in the case of esophageal atresia, you will find that you cannot pass the NG tube into the stomach, and that's because the esophagus ends in a blind pouch. And this is a characteristic finding of babies with esophageal atresia. If there is a fistula between the esophagus and the trachea, as we saw in some forms of esophageal atresia, the baby will develop gastric distension. That's because air is passing from the trachea into the stomach. And you can see an excess of air in the stomach on a chest x-ray of these children. In addition, these babies will have reflux of stomach contents, and they will develop aspiration pneumonia, and this will lead to respiratory distress. The treatment of esophageal atresia is a surgical repair, and the prognosis is generally okay. Sometimes there is residual dysmotility and swallowing problems in the esophagus, and these children often suffer from heartburn or gastroesophageal reflux disease as a result of damage that occurred to the esophagus. Next, let's talk about development of the midgut, and there are two phenomena that occur in midgut development that you need to know about. The first one is called herniation, and the second one is called rotation. Herniation is where the contents of the midgut normally exit the abdomen and then return. This is a normal part of development. Rotation is when the contents of the midgut rotate around the superior mesenteric artery. So we'll talk about both of these now, and we'll start with herniation. About the sixth week of development, the abdomen temporarily becomes too small. So the midgut herniates through the umbilical cord. And I've bolded the words through the umbilical cord because that will be important later. This is called physiologic herniation, and you can see it on fetal ultrasound. And the hernia will reduce, and the contents will go back into the abdomen by about the 12th week. If the midgut does not return to the abdomen, the baby will be born with an omphalocele. This is the persistence of the normal herniation process. Intestines will be outside of the body covered by a membrane. This is a picture of an omphalocele on the screen here. When the membrane only contains intestines, it's called a simple omphalocele. Normally, the liver does not herniate. However, if the lateral embryonic folds fail to form, then the liver can sometimes be in the omphalocele. This is a more complex defect. This is called a liver-containing omphalocele. The key features to know about, especially for step one, are that the intestines and the midgut are covered by peritoneum. That distinguishes omphaloceles from gastroschisis, which we'll talk about in a minute and also that it is through the umbilical cord. This feature also distinguishes omphaloceles from gastroschisis. Babies born with omphaloceles usually have normal GI function. Unfortunately, they often have an associated genetic defect. Trisomy 21, or Down syndrome, is very common. So is trisomy 18, which is Edwards syndrome, and trisomy 13. And there are many other associated congenital abnormalities that babies with omphaloceles often have. This includes congenital heart defects, up to half of children born with an omophalocele have a congenital heart defect, also oral facial clefts and neural tube defects. A related congenital abnormality to an omophalocele is called gastroschisis. This is extrusion of the bowel through the abdominal wall. The exact mechanism is not clear. It probably involves incomplete closure of the abdominal wall. Importantly, the bowel will herniate through a paraumbilical defect. It won't be through the umbilical cord. It's usually on the right side of the umbilical cord. And the intestines that are outside of the abdomen are not covered in peritoneum, and this distinguishes gastroschisis from an omphalocele. The problem with gastroschisis is that the bowel is usually damaged when it comes outside of the abdomen. So these children often have poor GI function. Gastroschisis is often associated with bowel atresia and stenosis, which we'll talk about later. The good news about gastroschisis is that it has few associated defects. So if GI function is restored, there's usually a good prognosis. It's rarely associated with Downs or other congenital conditions. So here's a slide comparing the two types of abdominal wall defects where you find abdominal contents outside of the baby. The first one is omphalocele, which is an umbilical defect. 
The bowel is covered by membranes. There are many associated conditions, but usually normal GI function. Gastroschisis, on the other hand, is a para-umbilical defect. The intestines will not be covered by membrane. There are few associated congenital conditions, but there is often poor GI function when the defect is resolved. And the treatment for both of these problems is surgical reduction and closure. Now let's talk about the rotation that occurs during midgut development. During physiologic herniation, when the bowel is outside the body, the bowel rotates. It twists around the superior mesenteric artery. This process continues after the bowel returns to the abdomen, and it results in the normal positioning of the small bowel and the colon. Importantly, it results in the cecum ending up in the right lower quadrant where it's normally found. When this process does not occur normally, it leads to malrotation of the gut, and this can cause a number of clinical problems. First of all, it can cause a bowel obstruction. The way this often happens is the cecum winds up in the mid-upper abdomen. When it winds up here, it stretches the peritoneum and creates bands of peritoneal tissue, fibrous bands called lad bands. These bands cross the duodenum and they often lead to duodenal obstruction. Malrotation can also cause volvulus. Volvulus occurs when the small bowel twists around the superior mesenteric artery. This leads to vascular compromise and ischemia and ultimately leads to a bowel obstruction. This is a drawing on the screen showing you what valvulus can look like. It's a twisting of the bowel. Babies who develop this problem develop vomiting and sepsis from bowel necrosis. They develop abdominal distension and blood can be found in the stool. And the treatment is urgent surgery. And then finally, malrotation can also lead to what's known as a left-sided colon, which is an anatomic variant. Normally, the small intestine winds through the middle of the abdomen and it connects via the cecum to the large intestine, which goes up and around. And you're probably familiar with this from anatomy. When malrotation leads to a left-sided colon, the small intestine snakes around on the right side of the abdomen. This is the abdomen here, this is the right side over here, this is the left side here. The small intestine will then plug into the large intestine at the cecum, and the large intestine will loop around on the left side of the body. Thus, if you have a division down the middle, the small intestine is on the right, the large intestine is on the left, hence the name left-sided colon. This is an anatomic variant that is sometimes picked up incidentally on abdominal imaging. Now let's talk about vitaline duct pathology. Recall before that I told you the vitaline duct is a remnant of the yolk sac. So you should know that in early development, the midgut retains its connection to the yolk sac. The hindgut and the foregut become enclosed tubes, but the midgut stays connected to the yolk sac. By week five, the connection with the yolk sac starts to narrow, and this narrowing is called the vitaline duct. It's sometimes also called the yolk stalk or the omphalomesenteric duct and normally it will disappear by about week nine. If it persists for any reason, you can develop a couple of different congenital anomalies. The most common and the most important is a Meckel's diverticulum, but you can also develop cysts and polyps. If we go back to this picture here, the yolk sac has been collapsed into this small structure here, and it's got a tiny, narrow connection to the midgut, and that's called the vitaline duct. And normally this whole thing is going to go away, but if it persists, you can get any of the problems we're gonna talk about now. The most important vitaline duct pathology is a Meckel's diverticulum. This is the most common congenital GI abnormality. It's a persistent remnant of the vitaline duct. And when you have a Meckel's diverticulum, you have a diverticulum or an outpouching or a bulge of small bowel that occurs at the ileum. This is easy to understand if you remember this picture and you remember that the entire gut tube is formed from the yolk sac, as is the vitaline duct shown here. So if the vitaline duct persists, then you are going to have a persistent bit of intestines. Remember, all this stuff in here coming from the yolk sac forms intestines, so the vitaline duct will also look like the intestines. It'll just be a little bulging outward, usually at the level of the ileum. It's very important that you understand that a Meckel's diverticulum is what's known as a true diverticulum, and this means it contains all layers of the intestine, the mucosa, the submucosa, and the muscular layer. Most diverticulum only contain the mucosa and the submucosa. Usually there is a defect or a hole in the muscular layer, and the mucosa and the submucosa protrude through that hole to form a diverticulum. To understand this, imagine that you have a mucosa and then a submucosa and then finally a muscular layer of the intestinal wall. Most diverticulum result from a hole in the muscular layer. When this hole occurs, these two layers herniate out through that hole, causing a diverticulum. This diverticulum only contains two layers of the wall, the mucosa and the submucosa. It does not contain all three. This is called a false diverticulum. A true diverticulum, on the other hand, like a Meckel's diverticulum, involves all three layers. In a Meckel's diverticulum, you have the muscular layer going like this, and the submucosa like this, and the mucosa like this, so that all three layers are part of that bulge or outpouching. That's relatively unusual. It's much more common for diverticulum, like the kind we talk about, in older people in the colon to occur from a breakdown of the muscular layer and thus to become a false diverticulum.
It's also high yield to know that Meckel's diverticulum often contains stomach tissue. This is called ectopic gastric tissue. Its origin is unclear, but as we'll see in a minute, this can be used for diagnosis. Sometimes these diverticulum also contain pancreatic tissue as well. And this is a picture of what a Meckel's diverticulum might look like. You can see mesentery here. This is a portion of intestine, and you can see that the diverticulum is protruding out from the intestinal wall, and it contains all three layers, the mucosa, the submucosa, and the muscular layer. Most people who have a Meckel's diverticulum do not know it, and they have no symptoms. When these are symptomatic, they can present at any age, but half present before age 10, and many people think of a Meckel's diverticulum as a childhood disorder. It's often discovered incidentally when someone has imaging of the abdomen for some reason, or if they have abdominal surgery, for example, to remove an inflamed appendix, sometimes a Meckel's diverticulum will be noticed on inspection. The ectopic gastric tissue present in the diverticulum may secrete acid, and this can cause ulceration and belly pain and sometimes bleeding, and potentially these diverticulum are a cause of obstruction or diverticulitis. There is something called the rule of twos that many people remember to recall the features of a Meckel's diverticulum. 2% of the population has a Meckel's. The male to female ratio is 2 to 1. They usually occur within 2 feet of the ileocecal valve in the ileum, and they are usually 2 inches in size. There are a couple of ways to make a diagnosis of a Meckel's diverticulum, but one of them is called a technetium scan. It's also sometimes called a Meckel's scan. The patient is administered a radio-labeled substance that is taken up by gastric cells in the diverticulum. Remember before, I said it's important to remember that there's often gastric tissue present in these diverticulum. The gastric tissue will then emit radiation that you can detect with a camera, and when you look at the small intestine, you will see the diverticulum light up from the presence of technetium. Another way to make the diagnosis is something called capsule endoscopy. This is where the patient swallows a capsule that takes pictures as it moves through the intestine, and sometimes in those images you can see the diverticulum. And the treatment for a symptomatic Meckel's diverticulum is surgery. There are some other rare vitaline duct anomalies. One of them is a vitaline cyst. This is often discovered incidentally when abdominal surgery is done for another reason. If this is the abdominal wall and this is the intestine, what happens in a cyst is that the vitaline duct largely obliterates and is replaced by fibrous tissue, but there will be a small opening or cyst that is present between the bands of fibrous tissue. Sometimes you can get a sinus. It will occur behind the umbilicus where the vitaline duct normally connects. In this situation, you have the abdominal wall and you have the small intestine. You'll then have fibrous tissue connected to a cavity behind the umbilicus like this. And then finally, rarely people can be born with a persistent vitaline duct. In this case, you will get intestinal discharge from the umbilicus. In this case, if the abdomen is here and this is the small intestine, the vitaline duct remains connected and contents from the intestine can go through that duct and discharge at the umbilicus. Now let's talk about atresia and stenosis of the abdomen. Atresia means a closed or absent opening. So a bowel that is atretic or that has atresia will end in a blind pouch. Stenosis means a narrowing of the bowel and this will lead to obstruction. And atresia and stenosis can develop anywhere in the GI tract. The duodenum is the most common location. The colon is the most rare. Fetuses with atresia or stenosis will have polyhydramnios. They're unable to effectively swallow the amniotic fluid from the mother, and so the mother will develop polyhydramnios. In addition, when these babies are born, they will have bilious vomiting. This is vomit that contains bile, and that's because the bile can't move down through their intestines because there is obstruction or the intestines end in a blind pouch in the case of atresia. Duodenal atresia probably occurs due to a failure of what's called recanalization. In early development, it turns out that the duodenum normally becomes occluded this is because of proliferation of the epithelium, which, as you know, comes from the endoderm. The patency of the duodenum is then restored by recanalization. So if you can imagine, if we have a section of the duodenum here, the endothelium begins to proliferate on both sides, and it proliferates so much that it obstructs the duodenum. Then there is a process by which it is recanalized and opened back up, and the result is that when the baby's born, you have a normal duodenum. If this process fails to occur, then you have a failure of recanalization, and that leads to obstruction in the duodenum. Two high-yield things to know about duodenal atresia is that it is associated with Down syndrome, and that it can lead to what's known as the double bubble sign on imaging. This occurs when there is distension of the duodenal stump and the stomach with a tight pylorus in the middle. Normally, the stomach leads into the pylorus and then goes into the duodenum. However, if the duodenum ends in a blind pouch from atresia, then the duodenum will become massively distended. As a result on imaging, you will see a swelling at the stomach, a swelling at the duodenum, and a tight narrowing here at the pylorus, and that's called the double bubble sign. As I told you before, the duodenum is the most common location for atresia, but it can rarely occur in the jejunum, the ileum, or the colon. 
When it occurs in these locations, the mechanism is believed to be vascular disruption. This is different from the mechanism for duodenal atresia. What is believed to occur is that ischemic necrosis of the intestine happens, and then the necrotic tissue is resorbed, and this leaves a blind end of the bowel. And the reason this is believed to be the mechanism for atresia in these locations is because atresia in these locations has been reproduced in animals by ligating the arterial supply to these sections of the intestine. There is a characteristic finding of the bowel when there is atresia of the jejunum, ileum, or the colon, and that's called apple peel atresia. What happens is the bowel distal to the blind end curls up like an apple peel, as shown in this picture on the screen. The idea here is that the bowel ends in a blind pouch, and then there is a space, and then the distal bowel is curled up like an apple peel, like I showed you on the last screen. That's called apple peel atresia, and that's what you see in jejunal, ileal, or colonic atresia. Moving on, let's talk about pyloric stenosis. The pylorus is the connection between the stomach and the duodenum. If you look at this picture at the bottom of the screen, this is the pylorus. It's where stomach contents exit the stomach and enter the small intestine. If there is hypertrophy of the pylorus, this leads to pyloric stenosis. This will cause intestinal obstruction. Classically, these babies present with projectile non-bilious vomiting. So non-bilious means clear or yellow vomiting. Bilious is usually dark green. The reason it is non-bilious is because the obstruction occurs prior to the entry of bile into the small intestine. Therefore, bile cannot get back into the stomach and is not part of the vomited material. Another key finding of pyloric stenosis is a palpable mass that feels like an olive. Remember, this will often occur in babies. They have very small abdomens that are easy to examine, and you can often feel the hypertrophic pylorus. The symptoms usually develop in the newborn period, usually at a few weeks old. 30% of babies with pyloric stenosis are firstborn children. The reason for this is not known, and it is more common in males. The last topic for this module is the embryology of the spleen, and the spleen is unusual in that it arises from the mesoderm. It is not from the endoderm like most of the structures we've been talking about in this module. Its blood supply, however, is the celiac trunk, just like the stomach, so it gets the blood supply of a structure from the endoderm and the foregut, but in fact it comes from the mesoderm. And in normal development, the stomach rotates and the spleen moves over to the left side where you usually will find it. It retains a connection to the stomach called the gastrosplenic ligament. It's also sometimes called the gastrolenal ligament. And this carries the short gastric arteries and left gastroepiploic vessels. This is a picture from our module on GI blood supply. This is the spleen shown here. This is the splenic artery coming off the celiac trunk, which supplies it with blood. These are the short gastric arteries, and this is the left gastroepiploic artery. Both of these can be found in the gastrosplenic ligament. And that concludes our module on GI embryology.